Good morning. On behalf of the Maryland Pesticide Education Network, welcome. So far, we've had some excellent presentations and good dialogue via chat and Jamboard in our conference. If you missed a session, don't worry. We'll send around the conference webpage link so you can access the videos and presentation slides. You're welcome to share them with your colleagues. We have a great program for you today as well. And we'll also be continuing with our Jamboard process today. Our fabulous moderator is Dr. Greg Allen. Greg has been a senior environmental scientist for over 20 years with EPA's Chesapeake Bay program. He brings a wealth of expertise on toxic contaminants in the Bay to this project. Luckily for us, Greg has been a guiding force in the pesticides in the Chesapeake Bay watershed project since it began. And he facilitates the Bay watershed project working group, uh, as well as acting as our moderator. Take it away, Greg. Hello, good morning, one and all. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. If you've been with us for our other two sessions, welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us today for the first time, we're very glad to have you. So we have conducted a bit of an experiment during our um, three sessions of the conference. This is a large group collaboration that we have undertaken, and we're going to uh, work on the next step in this today. And so let me give you a, a bit of background, particularly in case you haven't been with us on the other sessions. So in session one, we posed two questions and uh, we uh, used Jamboard and had over 90 people collaborating on answers to these questions. And we were looking for ideas about what the most important opportunities are um, for reducing risk from pesticides in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then we also asked what public education topics and management actions should we promote and advance. And um, as uh, Bonnie probably reminded everyone, we have a very unique structure in this pro this project. We have our for work groups and they produce uh, valuable uh, products in each of the areas that they focus on. And this data collection that we're working through and getting the ideas of the amazing people that are joining us for this conference is in part to inform those work groups about future work. So that's why these questions were oriented to opportunities and actions to promote and undertake. So we were in Jamboard in session one. Uh, we collected uh, really great ideas. In session two, we showed you a spreadsheet that was the summary of all the ideas that came in. And we put those ideas in categories like education and communications and alternatives. We um, did that affinity work and tr uh, tried to group ideas into categories. That is the information that is on the spreadsheet that was just uh, dropped again into chat. And we had provided it um, last week so that you could take a look at it and start thinking about among all those ideas that are there, which are the ones that seem to be the highest return on investment, the biggest bang for the buck, the most valuable, the most important. Now, we're going to get your input again using a tool that we haven't used yet, and that is Mentimeter. Okay, so we're starting to see some themes here, uh, in particular, uh, interest in education, awareness building, giving stakeholders a chance to find their voices and express their concerns. A few folks indicating that working with farmers and finding ways to implement BMPs that are protective and move to organic farming where it's possible. A 
managing the landscape in terms of reducing impervious surfaces and in particular managing turf land use in a way that is most sensitive to the use of pesticides. Definitely a strong theme on education, which is actually a very good fit for this uh, project and the folks that come together under this, uh, this effort. Education is a good fit. Okay. A couple people pointing to the questions around biosolids and whether land application of biosolids involves residues of pesticides. And there are also, this is Ruth Berlin, there are also several that uh, are talking about legislation and um, needing legislation to reduce pesticide use uh, whenever possible. Okay, thanks Ruth. I personally really like the use of the word alliances. Working with public health programs and expanding our network. And given our presentations last week, there was mention of needing more education on PFAS. And I assume that has to do with PFAS and pesticides. All right, fantastic. Thank you all for that input. Lots of good thinking here. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over to question two now. Okay, fantastic stuff coming in here. Seeing some really excellent pointers to things on the management side, uh, understanding and monitoring BMPs particularly related to stormwater, ensuring that we're using the full force of legislation and enforcement of existing laws. Great ideas on the education side, basic education on the risk of pesticides, perhaps the registration process and its strengths and limitations. Educating farmers, amplifying alternatives. That is a great set of words. And I, I really like, um encouraging us to promote stories, success stories on our social media. That's a wonderful mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, pesticide free uh, capital grounds in Annapolis, I would say. I think that's a great one. That's true. In fact, um, the Department of General Services just sent out a press release about the state house grounds being pesticide free. Me. Okay, more education here, human health impacts. A follow up from our last session about disinfectants, which are in very high use now, and among those which are safer than others. We saw a great presentation on a tool uh, presents that information at our last session. We can promote that more. Right, uh, on the science side, I'd like to uh, making sure that the work that's been done by the team at USGS 
and others. And we heard great presentation from Vicki Blazer on this work about what we understand about the association of pesticides in places where we're also seeing impacts to fish health. Um, so in our first session, we did a large group jam board and brainstormed on ideas about how to make a difference on this topic. In our second session, we looked at themes and affinity groupings of what you had said. And today we looked through that list and tried to pick out the highest bang for the buck uh, activities. What we will do now is make sure that all of this information gets to our work groups and it will help inform our work groups. It will help inform next year's conference and we really appreciate the uh, participation and the information that you shared with us. All right, well, let's now move into the rest of our agenda for this morning. We have three fabulous uh, presentations coming this morning uh, from Hannibal Kemmerer at the uh, Office of the Attorney General in Maryland. We're gonna hear about environmental justice policies and activities in the Attorney General's office and its connection to pesticides. Uh, from Leila Borrero Kraus, we're gonna hear about uh, food and farm workers and how pesticides may impact their well-being. Then Amy Liebman, uh, social justice for food and farm workers and linking together health and COVID-19 and it's going to give us a lot of insights about the experience of being a, a food and farm worker. Hannibal Kemmerer is Attorney General Frosch's Chief Counsel for Legislative Affairs. He's been a Maryland attorney for over 20 years. He practiced civil rights law at a small firm prior to serving as an assistant general counsel at the NAACP's national headquarters in Baltimore. After that, Hannibal worked for the U.S. Senate's Judiciary Committee for six years, ultimately serving as chief counsel for the Crime and Drugs Subcommittee. Hannibal joined the Office of Attorney General in 2019 after an eight-year stint at Squire Patton Boggs, a multinational law firm. Hannibal graduated with a BA from Arizona State University and a JD from the George Washington School of Law, Go Colonials, love it. Okay, thank you so much Hannibal for joining us today and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Um, appreciate the auspicious uh, introduction and um, really delighted to be here. Uh, so luckily for me, I, I uh, get to go first. I understand you're going to have some really phenomenal uh, presentations after me, so uh, forgive me for this one. Uh, but if we could go to the first slide, uh, I'm going to talk about roughly four things. One, uh, the new DEI guidance that our office issued last month. Uh, two, um, our you know work to uh, produce an environmental um, enforcement bill that will uh, be before the the general assembly in in the coming weeks. Uh, three, our efforts to protect workers, uh, particularly during the pandemic, and fourth and finally, um, our efforts to uh, eliminate chlorpyrifos and challenge the EPA's uh, tolerances. So. Let me just start out with the DEI guidance. Last month, our office promulgated a framework for AGs um, throughout state government uh, to integrate principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into their work where appropriate. Um, so all of our attorneys now are supposed to review policies, regulations, contracts, practices with an eye towards improving uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. We ask ourselves a series of eight questions in the course of our work. Um, here are the questions. I, I won't read all of them, but uh, the first one is, how is equity expressly incorporated within the policy? Um, second, does the policy explicitly account for potential disparate outcomes 
for traditionally disadvantaged communities? And if so, how? Uh, the third question is, are policy outcomes tracked so that potential disparities can be monitored? Is there a plan to address disparate outcomes? Uh, does the plan include a concrete timeline and action items? Fourth question is, will the policy increase access and opportunity for traditionally uh, disadvantaged communities? And if so, how? Next slide, please. Will the policy further equity, increase inclusion, and allow for full participation for all people? Um, and do stakeholder groups include members from impacted communities, including community subgroups, et cetera? Uh, will the policy protect against violence, profiling, and discrimination? If so, how? Are there changes that could be made to the policy uh, to make it more equitable and inclusive so as to reduce legal risks and align better with non-discrimination and civil rights laws? And then finally, what are the economic, social, and other benefits of not just ensuring that the policy complies with relevant non-discrimination laws, but also um, further reducing legal risks under such laws? So these are all things that inform our work uh, on a going forward basis and that we're proud to have uh, adopted in the last month. Um, next slide, please. So this is a comprehensive, very large bill that the Attorney General intends to introduce uh, at the beginning of session. It's pre-filed, so uh, maybe online um, before the end of the month. And we certainly would love for uh, this group to support the legislation. Um, the proposed priority bill seeks to address gaps in the state's authority to enforce laws governing safe drinking water, wastewater facility operation, waterway construction and dam safety, and tidal and non-tidal wetlands. Next slide, please. <clears throat> With respect to drinking water, the um, bill would amend the state's drinking water statutes to authorize MDE to pursue injunctive relief and administrative and civil enforcement and penalties against persons who violate the state's drinking water rules and regulations. The bill harmonizes our drinking water statute with other enforcement provisions under the environmental article. It allows civil penalties for any violation of the subtitle. It removes the requirement that MDE prove civil violations or breaches of administrative orders are willful uh, before liability can be imposed. And it increases the civil penalties for drinking water violations uh, from $5,000 to $10,000. Uh, capped at $100,000 for any single enforcement action. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to the Maryland Water Quality Laboratory Certification Act, uh, the bill amends that title to authorize MD to pursue injunctive relief and administrative and civil remedies um, against water quality laboratories. The statute governs the certification and operation of laboratories that perform testing and certification of drinking water under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, this, the, under current law, the sole provisions to enforce this subtitle are reprimanding, suspending, or revoking a water quality laboratory certification uh, or a criminal misdemeanor. Those are, those are all rather draconian. This establishes authority for the department to issue administrative orders and conduct hearings, and it amends um, the statute to include civil and administrative penalties. Uh, and authorizes the department to pursue injunctive relief. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to Maryland Water Works and Waste Systems Operators Act, uh, these provisions are amended to add sections with injunctive relief and administrative and civil enforcement and penalties. The statute requires drinking water and wastewater facilities to employ a superintendent or operator who is licensed by the state um, to oversee operations and ensure compliance with the state and federal law. Currently, the sole provision to enforce this title against drinking water or wastewater facilities is a criminal misdemeanor uh, of $25 per incident. Um, section 12-501 is amended to require drinking and wastewater facilities to annually report to the state, the superintendents, operators, and industrial operators who are participating in the uh, facility operation. Section 12-502 and Section 12-503 um, are currently reserved, but these sections would be replaced with authority for the department, that's MDE, to conduct hearings and issue administrative orders. Uh, the bill also amends Section 12-504 to include civil and administrative penalties and adds a Section 12-505 to authorize the department to pursue injunctive relief. Next slide, please. 
with respect to waterway construction and dam safety, um, the bills uh, amends the law to provide MDE the ability to recover civil penalties and provide for uh, administrative enforcement and penalties. Next slide, please. Um, so the two non the non title uh, wetlands protection act and the title wetlands protection act are both uh, amended under the provisions of this bill to provide um, for MDE to uh, seek penalties and also um, basically it, it amends the law to uh, permit them to uh, do more than just criminal fines now they can do uh, uh, administrative penalties, and they have new authorities. Next slide, please. All right, so um, finally getting to pesticides. Uh, every year in Annapolis, uh, our office uh, supports legislation to ban uh, chlorpyrifos. Um, most recently, uh, the bill passed, and it's actually uh, a great bill. It's even further than uh, the EPA's um, uh, you know, work in this in this space. We were also Maryland was part of a multi-state coalition challenging um, EPA's denial of objections to its decision not to revoke tolerances associated with uh, chlorpyrifos. And we finally this year won uh, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, which held that if EPA could not make a safety finding requiring required by statute that the AG, agency had to revoke. Uh, chlorpyrifos toler tolerances. And so on remand, the EPA uh, finally did revoke the tolerances. And this is a major victory for anyone who eats food because of the um, neurological damage that chlorpyrifos causes in especially small children. Uh, we think that this is also very uh, helpful for workers, many of whom, you know, are black and brown. Uh, and so we're, we're really excited about that victory. Next slide, please. Um, generally speaking, uh, our office supports workers. We uh, support requiring employers to provide paid leave uh, to workers who must self-quarantine because of the pandemic. Uh, we support requiring the Commissioner of Labor to adopt Maryland OSHA regulations to address aerosol transmissible diseases among workers. Uh, including the, the Attorney General testifying uh, in favor of such legislation uh, in the last session. We also support improved working and living conditions for migrant workers, H2As, H2Bs, um, who are here you know, temporarily to do seasonal work um, in and along the, the Eastern Shore. Uh, generally speaking, our office opposes efforts to undermine worker health protections. Uh, we oppose legislation exempting family farm workers and fruit and vegetable peddlers from minimum wages. Um, we also oppose legislation undermining prevailing wages for skilled laborers. So um, Attorney General Frosch uh, is a friend to working people and it's uh, always a pleasure to, to work in concert with this uh, inestimable group uh, in Annapolis. Next slide, please. I am open for questions, and uh, if people prefer, they can call me offline or email me at hkimmer at oag.state.md.us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much, Hannibal. What, what amazing work. What important and, and constructive and helpful work you're doing there. Really great. So um, I, I don't think I mentioned that we are in Zoom webinar today. So there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. And we prefer that if you have questions for our presenters that you place them there in Q&A. You can also use chat if you prefer that. Uh, but Hannibal, let's look here uh, in chat. And I'm sorry, in Q&A. Uh, there's a question, what are the ways the Office of the Attorney General plans to advocate for workers in the 2022 session? Anything on the radar yet? What, um, traditionally what we do is we, you know, every week new bills are introduced up until basically crossover date. And um, we meet with the Attorney General the Friday before bill hearings. 
and uh, we go over every you know legislative item that's that's up the following week. And he directs us uh, to either support, oppose, or um, uh, or you know ignore, not not do anything with with specific legislation. And generally speaking, uh, even even departmental bills like Department of Labor, uh, occasionally they'll have a bill that they think further harmonizes um, you know state law with federal law. But during the last administration, um, we generally would oppose those. We think that you know the state law and the state worker protections need to step into the, the breach when the federal administration tries to um, uh, essentially like, you know, benefit employers over employees. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing immediately on the horizon that I'm aware of. Um, Pre-filed bills will be online this month, later this month, and uh, we'll definitely be taking a look at them. Things that benefit workers, we support, generally speaking. Things that um, don't we oppose, generally speaking. Okay, well, we'll look, look forward to see what ends up on the agenda this year. Here's another one. Um, let, let's talk about chlorpyrifos specifically. So the, the uh, question here is, are there any challenges planned to allowing the use of chlorpyrifos on golf courses? Is, is that an allowed use now in Maryland under the new bill? You know, it's been a while since I looked at the legislation and Bonnie or Ruth might, might know better than, than I, but um, I, I think that it's not an allowed use. I could be wrong, um, but Bonnie or Ruth? It's not an allowed use. Yeah. Um, the Maryland regulation goes beyond EPA, EPA's um, law is that you can't use it on food crop. And the Maryland law is no use at all on golf courses or anywhere else. Okay, all right, Ruth, thank you for that. Uh, now on, on that, uh, Hannibal, what are the enforcement provisions related to chlorpyrifos? Are, are there inspectors out there enforcing this? How, how is implementation working out? Yeah, I, I suspect that there aren't a ton of inspectors, but um, you know, it, it's it's just not allowed to be sold and used in Maryland any longer. So I think that you know there will be less use of it unless unless people go out of state uh, to to locate chlorpyrifos. And there's obviously there's alternatives uh, that you can use in state. Okay, good. Uh, here's another one uh, taking us over to a different active ingredient that's uh, in the news a lot these days, and that's glyphosate, the active ingredient in the product Roundup. Uh, and this uh, person is asking, uh, had seen some articles about uh, legal actions around glyphosate across the states, um, that there is a new suit announced against Monsanto. But if I if I'm following it right, the Monsanto issue is PCBs and not related to uh, pesticides. Uh, but uh, back, is that right? Hannibal? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. We do have uh, we do have litigation against Monsanto for PCBs. Uh, it was just announced, I think, on the 23rd of last month. But it it wasn't it didn't uh, concern glyphosate and. Frankly, I don't know whether we have any investigations uh, of that particular pesticide. Okay. Yes, that new suit has to do with PCBs and other states uh, ha have sued Monsanto and there have been large awards made uh, that we're hoping will help us with PCBs in the watershed. Um, so we'll keep up on that uh, and I run the risk of getting off track here because we're real concerned about PCBs too. So uh, very interested in that. Uh, so here's another question. Would the drinking water bill help with pesticides impact on well water? Uh, and we know that in places like um, agricultural settings where there's a high volume of pesticides used on farms, um, agencies such as USGS report some uh, presence of pesticides in groundwater that can be used for drinking water. 
Yeah, I, I think I, I think it will absolutely help. Um, among other things, it it allows uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment to bring administrative actions, so they don't have to go to the circuit court. Um, they can just bring an administrative action, and uh, you know use that as a means to a cudgel to stop people from uh, you know harming the drinking water um, and they don't have to go convince the judge etc so it's it's actually they also don't have to prove uh, that the conduct is willful it's much similar to um, uh, Greg the EPA's authorities that are more sort of uh, strict liability uh, than than you know willful or requiring scienter uh, in in those circumstances. So I think yeah I think it's definitely going to be beneficial. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Um, one more question here, Hannibal, just generally speaking, um, how does the Office of the Attorney General work with MDE to identify populations that are underserved or at risk? And how, and how, do, you, how do the two agencies work together to try to help those communities that we see are at risk and underrepresented? Um, so, I mean, as, as you saw from our DEI uh, guidance, we, we try to do that with, with all of our work. And so we have assistant attorneys general in MDE, but we have them at the Department of Agriculture, at all of the executive branch um, uh, agencies. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we do try to um, infuse our work with uh, considerations of, you know, underrepresented populations, et cetera. And, our MDE attorneys are mindful of, you know, the, the, the black and brown folks and other underrepresented uh, populations and, you know, how they are impacted by environmental harms. So yeah, we just try to infuse all of our work with, with, with that uh, recognition and acknowledgement. Wow, okay, that's a, that's a great system. Sounds like a good network that you guys have inserted across those agencies we try <laughs> yeah okay really neat okay well um i'm not seeing any other questions any any last words uh, hannibal you'd like to conclude with no just my my sincere thanks to this group for inviting uh inviting me and giving us an opportunity to talk about our agenda all right. Well, uh, likewise, thank you for joining us today. That's amazing work that you guys are doing in that office. And I hope this is the start of being able to hear from you on a regular basis and see how some of those efforts are moving along. We'd love to have you as a regular participant. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, let's now move to our next presentation. These are uh, actually a pair of presentations because uh, they're really uh, well matched. They're speaking to uh, similar topics here having to do with social justice for food and farm workers. Amy Liebman. Amy has devoted her career to improving the safety and health of disenfranchised populations through research, policy, advocacy, and education. She has served as Migrant Clinicians Network's Director of Environmental and Occupational Health since 1999. Uh, there, um, she established nationally recognized training and technical assistance programs for community groups and health centers throughout the country. Amy's programs have won awards, including the EPA Children's Environmental Health Champion Award and the National Safety Council Research Collaboration Award. In 2011, Amy received the Lauren Kerr Award for the American Public Health Association for her sustained efforts to improve the lives of workers. She's currently a member of the Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee, a federal advisory committee to the US EPA Office of Pesticide Programs. 
Amy holds a master's degree from the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a master's degree from the Institute of Latin American Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Layla is Puerto Rican from the city of Quinepa, Ponce, and came to the US in 1975. Since 1986, Layla has worked with migrant workers in various capacities, addressing problems that affect the migrant. She started working on social services in Cambridge, Maryland, helping with the food stamp program. After that, Layla began working with health clinics as a medical interpreter and farm worker health educator. This led her into legal services, supporting workers in the fields in Maryland and Delaware. Layla then went to work with Catholic charities, addressing immigration challenges, and from there, she joined the CATA Farm Worker Support Committee in 2012. Layla believes she has learned much from the people that she has known through this work and their sharing of cultures and traditions, which has deeply enriched her. So we've got a great team here. In my work as an organizer, and immigration specialist for CATA, Farm Workers Support Committee. I work directly with the workers and their families and see firsthand the hardship conditions these workers endure. Farm workers are often housed in overcrowded substandard conditions. Sometimes employers house them in barracks or motels. I often see people Six, at least six people pack into a tiny motel room with one single bed. These overcrowded conditions have been specifically dangerous during our COVID pandemic. There is often a bathroom issue with workers' housing. There are not enough showers, sink, and toilets to accommodate the numbers of people who need them. Um, I have seen 10 people who have to share one bathroom. And we, I have H2A workers with visas, agricultural workers, H2B seafood workers who are here as temporary immigrant workers. Some are put in houses that have been left in some states of incomplete repair where the bathroom lacks a uh, working shower or sink, or the kitchen is not functional. There are no, no laundry facilities, and workers are afraid to complain because if they do, they fear they will not be called back next year or for their work visa. For food and farm workers, access to health care is limited or inaccessible because workers are housed in uh, isolated areas with no transportation of their own. They depend on the employer transportation. And during the pandemic, they ha it has been very hard to get H2A workers vaccinated. For example, I have to coordinate finding a health agency who could, could test and vaccinate uh, one household of aid workers. The workers only do this on the weekend or evening because if they only work, you know, they have to take off from work, but the hours of operation for the health department close at three for vaccination. We have also have issues when non-English speakers calls the, the health department for services, but all the funds prompts are in English, so they're blocked that way also. Workers generally have no pay sick time. So if they are ill, they are afraid to call out sick. We usually would not complain fearing loss of income or, or loss of the job. When workers go to work sick, especially in the pandemic, they have been urged to work with, with fever, 
fevers and giving ice cream to lower the, therm the thermometer reading. My husband's name is Miska Jean-Baptiste. He started having a fever and they still don't send him home. And there was other people who was test uh, positive. They never tell no coworker, they, they don't tell nobody. Every time he went, they, they check him and they give him ice cream so they can chill the fever. And after four days, um, he said um, he don't feel good. So I take him to a doctor and I had to go to the ER with him. And he spent 10 days there and then they passed away. Farm workers often lack potable water and bathrooms at the job size. Workers working in extreme weather condition is the norm. Workers start their work day at 6 or 7 a.m. and do not end until 7 p.m. at night. This is hard back-breaking work with little rest time. They are also dealing with harmful impacts of exposure to pesticide that they are applying at times. And in the watermelon fields, the workers are harvesting in August, the humid humidity drives the heat index much higher than the actual temperature and farm workers all often urge back to work with less than half an hour for lunch and are given very little, little time to rest. Poultry workers and poultry plants labor is close proximity to each other where line speeds require them to stand close together. They must work fast and sh with sharp knives and one slip can cause a serious injury. Poultry workers often have to buy their own equipment to work, uh, such as gloves to protect their hands, sometimes masks and hats, boots to work in the plant where there's a lot of water. Um, bathroom breaks are an issue in poultry plants because workers tell me they have to wear adult diapers in many plants before, because they are, are not allowed to leave the line to go to the bathroom. These families often struggle to survive on the edge of crisis. I was contacted uh, recently to help a farm worker last week. The husband, a US military vet, has had committed suicide and on top of the, that, the family is now facing housing crisis because they could no longer afford to stay in their homes. And I will turn this to Amy to tell you more about these workers' challenges and what is the need. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Amy Liebman from the Migrant Collisions Network. And I'd like to just uh, piggyback onto what uh, Layla talked about and think about some of the social justice uh, concerns and some of the policy implications around that. Can you go to the next slide, please? So Migrant Clinicians Network is a national organization. We've been around since 1984, and we work on creating practical solutions at the intersection of vulnerability, migration, and health. And we envision a world based on health, justice, and equity where migration is never an impediment to well being. We do a number of programs from advocacy to research to, to program interventions, but most of our work supports uh, providing training, education, and technical assistance to community clinics and community organizations in order to improve healthcare access and healthcare quality for our immigrant and migrant workers and their families. Next slide, please. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of both Migrant Clinicians Network and the Marylanders for Food and Farm Worker Protection. And this is a broad uh, and diverse coalition that uses advocacy groups, organizing, um, public education to win back basic health and safety rights and, projection, and protections for poultry workers, crab pickers, farm workers um, that are vulnerable because of our, our, our food system. We are working on a number of different efforts together, looking at mandatory worker protections in terms of state emergency temporary standards, particularly around COVID, um, improving data collection for infectious disease outbreaks, focusing on industry and occupation, 
looking at a protective uh, heat related illness standard and also um, emergency preparedness plan for infectious disease outbreaks. Next slide. So with that introduction of our, our two organizations, I wanna focus on just who are our, our food and, and farm workers. And a lot of the photos that you saw in Layla's video and in this presentation are done by Earl Dodder. He's a, a Marylander. And we've done a lot of work together, particularly on the Eastern shore, um, looking at the different occupations that our immigrants contribute to. Next slide, please. So our, our immigrant and migrant workers, um, our, our food and farm workers are largely immigrant and migrant. Um, about three quarters of them come from another country. Uh, their English proficiency um, is limited and they speak largely Spanish, Haitian Creole, or even indigenous languages. Um, their immigration status is mixed. You heard Layla talk about H2A workers or H2B workers. Um, so basically what we're seeing is a group of workers those who are working in agriculture can be here with, with a certain kind of temporary visa. Um, and those who are working in our chicken plants um, have um, other kinds of, of work authorization. And those working in our crab picking plants um, also have different types of visas. Many of um, our workers also do not have legal authorization to work in the US. So that the, depending on visa status, that makes them um, can increase their vulnerability quite, quite a bit. Um, and even those with visas um, are very concerned about being able to work and not wanting to cause any problems and not wanting to leave their job site for any reason because they're here to make money. But immigration status becomes very important, important when we look at um, worker rights. Also, a lot of our immigrant workers and migrant workers have lower levels of formal education. It doesn't mean that they're dumb. It doesn't mean that they're, they don't have a lot of, um, education that's particular to the work that they're doing, but if the formal education in terms of formal schooling, they, they don't have and literacy levels are, are low. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna talk now, that's just a, a general overview of sort of the, the demographics that we're talking about, but um, just thinking about sort of what are some of the risks that these workers face on the, their job. Um, pesticide exposure is a, a really important risk both for our farm workers who are working in um, uh, harvesting and um, our food, as well as those also um, working to process our, our meats. Um, this coalition, the Maryland um, Food and Farm Worker Project that got together, we originally got together um, early in oh, not, March, 2020, um, when we were concerned about farm workers being provided adequate respiratory protection to protect them from pesticides. Um, and so when we think about this pesticide exposure, I may be coming at it to you today from a very much a worker health and safety standpoint, but having workers um, you know, properly treated, properly educated, properly protected um, and trained on how to use and apply the pesticide has a really important impact on our environment and, and the bays because when pesticides are not applied properly, or sometimes in cases when they actually are, um, we still have a lot of um, runoff into the Chesapeake Bay. So really um, the way that we like to think about it is that when we're, we're looking at farm worker protections, we're also looking at protections that ultimately are gonna protect our communities and, and our environment. Next slide. Um, another really important risk and it's growing um, in Maryland and across the country is um, heat related uh, illness and farm workers have are 20 times more likely to die from heat related illness than other workers so uh, getting a strong protective standard passed for um, or implemented for farm workers is going to be really important in this coming year. And just a note on um, heat related illness and pesticides is that we have a lot of concerns about what it will take to protect workers um, from pesticides interfering with what it will take to protect them from heat. So that's an issue that we really try to balance to make sure that we're not overheating our workers but keeping them protected from both heat and pesticides. Next slide. Um, in addition to pesticides and the heats, there's a number of um, other risks and hazards that our, our workers face um, from crowded housing to crowded transportation to sort of to unsafe transportation. Um, pesticides I've already mentioned, but there's also other chemical exposures, um, all kinds of injuries, infectious diseases, 
I always put carbon monoxide poisoning in there because we forget sometimes that when it gets really cold and it does um, in many of our workers' housings that sometimes um, you know, using other types of, of uh, heating sources can cause carbon monoxide poisoning. And then um, our, our worker population is not immune from all the other chronic um, illnesses that the rest of our standing population faces, but because of their work, um, it may be very hard to help manage that, like, like diabetes and, and taking a break to sort of um, address your, your insulin. All those are really important factors impacting um, workers um, on, on the job. Next slide, please. Um, our, our poultry workers or our, our protein processors, those in the seafood industry, they face a number of um, really important risks on the job. Um, Layla mentioned some of them. But as a result, um, we're seeing um, high levels of musculoskeletal disorders uh, from back strain to carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, they are exposed to chemicals and pathogens. And um, most of the disinfectants that they use are also registered pesticides. And these disinfectants and the use of the disinfectants increase substantially during COVID. So exposure to them is a really important concern and wanting to make sure that we're addressing that is important. Also, there's traumatic injuries um, from machines and tools that result in um, not only lacerations, but amputations. Um, next slide, please. So we're looking at a population um, because of, of who they are and, and who, who and their work are made more vulnerable by these circumstances. There is like cultural and language differences that are really important. They're often entering into a, a occupations that are, are low wage. So poverty are important issues. Um, the inherent uh, dangers and health risks um, in their job make them particularly more vulnerable. I talked a lot about immigration status already. Um, many of our immigrants um, are, are folks that are here living in our communities and working, but others are, are migrating back and forth between um, their home country or their home state um, to, to Maryland to, to work. And that poses a whole set of other vulnerabilities. The lack of access to healthcare, health insurance, and other financial resources make them more vulnerable. And then most importantly, I think one of the things that this group might be concerned of is that this is a group that is systematically um, uh, working with uh, regulatory protection that is not afforded to other workers. Next slide, please. Um, so there's particularly for our farm worker population, it's a little bit different when we look at our farm workers who are, are working um, in the field versus our poultry workers. There's some, some different types of um, regulatory policies around them, but there's some, there's some crossover. But with farm workers in particular, there's been a long history of farm, what we call farm worker exceptionalism. The laws that um, protect all of us in our workplace, um, some of the labor laws that started in the 1930s, farm workers have been systematically excluded. So the Fair Labor Standard Act from the 1930, which brought about minimum wage, um, over time got rid of child labor, farm workers were by and large um, uh, excluded from that. And um, there's been some changes at the state over the years with that, but they continue to sort of address the challenges from the 1930s of laws that protect all of us um, that they're excluded from. Workers' compensation is different for agricultural workers. There's only 14 states that require um, employers to provide the same type of workers' compensation to agricultural workers as to other workers. Uh, that when we look at the agency, uh, you know, that's made responsible to keep a, help workers have a safe and healthy workplace or OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they have very few standards that are aimed at specifically at farm workers. And a lot of the pesticide related regulation is not even in the agency that's charged with worker health and safety, it's in the agency that's charged with regulating pesticides. So there's definitely like a, a regulatory conflict of interest in and, in and of itself by having the EPA be responsible for farm worker protection when it comes to protecting workers from pesticide exposure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on any given day prior to the pandemic, we were looking at um, a workforce that was made vulnerable by a number of, of different reasons. The pandemic comes and all of a sudden these workers who suffer injury and exploitation on their job are now deemed essential workers. We had our farm workers, 
the meat and chicken and seafood processors, dairy workers, all were deemed essential workers. Next slide. That meant they had to go to work and they couldn't work from their living rooms or their bedrooms like many of us did. And it should be no surprise to this group that more than 70% of the immigrants in the United States actually worked in jobs that were classified as essential. Next slide. So it's, again, it's not surprising that COVID-19 impacted our Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and immigrant communities and peoples of color, people of color more so um, than our, our white population. If we're looking just from the CDC data on Hispanic or Latinx um, in comparison to, to the white non-Hispanic population when it comes to COVID, we're looking at an infection rate um, 1.9 times higher, a hospitalization rate 2.8 times higher, and a death rate 2.3 times higher. Um, go, go to the next slide, please. Um, and this is just the, the Kaiser Family Foundation put those stats um, for all of our different um, ethnic and uh, uh, racial groups into a chart. And you can see um, that our Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and people of color are more disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Next slide. Uh, I always go to Purdue University before I do a presentation like this. They have a really great dashboard that they have these um, estimates that they look at. Um, and we're really seeing that about 936,000 ag workers have been infected with, uh, with COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So one of the challenges that we have with, um, when we look at the food and farm workers is that we have, somehow meshed public health policy with what we consider worker benefits. And really what I want us to start thinking about and to, as we sort of think about policy change is that what we think of traditionally as worker benefits are really public health policies. And we were really hurt during this pandemic because we didn't consider them public health policy and we, we still don't. Um, and so when it comes to paid sick leave, you want workers to be able to be able to quarantine or to isolate as needed, um, but they should also be compensated for that time. Um, limited testing and few requirements about testing. Um, that's not a worker benefit. That is a public health policy. The limitations in, in personal protective equipment, housing and transportation, all of those sort of we tend to look at in the workplace um, as worker benefits, but we need to shift our focus to thinking about these types of policies as benefiting public health and not just individual workers. Next slide. Um, and in addition to the lack of policies, um, which really impacted these workers and impacted why they were so um, drastically uh, in, impacted with COVID-19 in the workplace, we also had a lot of rhetoric from politicians, from media, from others, that placed the blame for COVID-19 on the workers. There were quotes in the media about like their home and their social conditions were the cause of the meatpacking outbreaks. Oh, it was their living circumstances. They were just so crowded in certain cultures. Um, they go to school and work in buses and they're all packed like sardines. All of this was to take the blame off of what was happening in workplaces and put that, that blame onto, onto individual workers. And uh, again, doing that, um, I think, supported lack of public policy that ultimately would have better protected not only workers, but also our public health. Next slide, please. Um, this is a quote from a colleague of mine, Gerardo um, Chavez um, from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Many of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers workers, they have worked not only in Florida, but they also come and work um, here in Maryland um, on the Eastern Shore where I am, um, in the summer harvesting and um, tomatoes. Um, but farm workers say, you hear the job that we do is essential, but you realize as a worker, you're not treated as essential, you're treated as dispensable. Next slide. Um, and this is a quote uh, from um, MCN's former board chair, Dr. Ever Galvez. Uh, she is a physician uh, working in the Virginia Garcia Health Center. Um, she was interviewed by the New York Times and where she was talking about how challenging it was to help protect the workers that she was caring for when there were not regulatory protections 
um, in the workplace. And she saw throughout COVID the impact of what it meant um, to not have regulations that were protecting workers in place as COVID was sweeping through the farm worker communities that she was caring for. Next slide. Um, so what are, what are the regulatory and policy solutions that we need to be thinking about? Um, um, definitely temporary or standards and emergency orders. Um, obviously, I think there's a lot of challenges in getting them in for the long term, but ultimately we would like some longer term ones. But let's face it, you know, every day we wake up and we look at the news, um, we are looking at a, a pandemic that doesn't seem to want to leave us. Um, and so workers still need to be protected. We need to have um, regulations in place that is going to talk about helping to get workers vaccinated, helping them to leave um, and get paid if they need to, to get vaccinated or recover from side effects, and for reporting to happen if there are outbreaks um, or breakthroughs um, in the workplace. We still wanna make sure that workers are provided with the proper protective equipment, um, that physical distancing remains in place in many workplaces, that proper and safe disinfection takes place so that workers are protected, that workers, particularly those who are not vaccinated, but workers um, also participate in testing so that we can make sure that we're not um, creating an outbreak or exposing other workers in the workplace. Um, looking at changes to housing and transportation in order to reduce the spread of infectious disease and also really important, but paid sick leave is also a critical piece to some of these policies that are needed. Next slide. Oh. Uh, in Maryland, we've been working really, really hard to get improved surveillance in data collection. And, and we really wanna see industry and occupation included in understanding the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So as data is collected in workplaces, as data is collected, um, if they're through contact tracing, through case investigation, really understanding the industry and occupation is critically important. Why is that so important? Again, it's public health policy. You can't have public health, you can't have good public health without improved surveillance. And you can't have that surveillance if you don't have the data. And so in many ways, we were flying blind in Maryland because we did not have stronger standards in place, which looked at reporting of workplace outbreaks um, and really understanding the work relatedness of COVID-19. And in places around the country like Washington State and, and Puerto Rico, where we did have improved documentation, we were able to see much more clearly what we know what was happening was the work relatedness of the COVID-19 outbreaks. Next slide. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're looking for in terms of the risks that our workers face in the workplace, whether it's around pesticide policy or COVID-19 and the emergency standards and the regulations that we need around that, our food and farm workers deserve a safe and healthy workplace. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I guess Layla and I are, are here for questions. Is that what we're supposed to do now? Great. Yes, that's right. Yes, thank you, uh, Layla and Amy, for these insights on the life experiences of our farm and food workers. Uh, I, I know personally that I like produce and crab and chicken and you know so i'm i'm part of this uh and i i think that we see that in some of the other comments that have come in um people are asking how can we help how can we get involved have you pointed to any opportunities for people to uh, join the organizations that you guys work with on a volunteer basis to help out? Go ahead, Leila. Okay. Um, here in Salisbury, we have a task force that is um, of many agencies, local agencies that provide services to the communities have also been um, providing services to immigrants and migrants and people of, of you know, dark, uh, black and brown colors. We go into different uh, areas in our communities. We go into different counties and providing information, 
uh, also providing food and the services that are available in this community for everybody and being brought to the workers, um, you know, in their communities and in the area that they may live, um, going north, east, west, south, you know, we're going in all directions with this task force. Task force, um, we have only one politician, right, Amy, involved in this uh, group, I believe. Um, we have people from the city and the county and other um, nonprofit organizations, um, part of it. We get involved with the hospital and the local health departments to provide testing and bring, you know, the COVID-19 uh, vaccination to them. We're going to different churches and also, you know, the, the Haitian Community Center has been very helpful in the area. Um, that's as part of, you know, what we bring into their communities. We have CATA, the Farm Workers Support Committee. We provide information about immigration. And we also, you know, we collaborate with Amy and, and other groups. Um, there are specifically for farm workers across the state or across county lines. So Leila, Le Le thank you so much. You just, you described what we call the Vulnerable Population Task Force here on, on the Eastern Shore in Salisbury. And we really came together to really look at locally. Um, and that's something I think is super important when we think of COVID-19. You know, it's a little bit of a different scenario as we head into 2022, but when COVID-19 first came about, local and, and state entities were sort of left high and dry. And we needed to figure out really quickly how to work on the ground and, and mobilizing at the very local level became really important. And the Vulnerable Population Task Force brought together, as Leila said, all these different agencies and organizations, community groups to really help address those who were made even more vulnerable by the pandemic. And, and what I see coming out of that, I think is in a really important next step or, or ways to sort of think about COVID and beyond is that importance of those partnerships, of bringing community groups and health departments together, bringing community groups um, together with some of the businesses. There was like a lot of housing groups and, and even realtors involved um, and really understanding the reality of what it means to call a health department and not be able to speak the language there or really not understand the information or the instructions that are being told about how to keep yourself safe. And there's been a lot of growth. So I think where we were in, in March, 2020 and where we are right now in December of 2021, we've seen a lot of changes, but that has really, I think, emerged from the bottom up because we didn't have a lot of structure. And as we now have an administration at the federal level with more structure, more support, I think that local community level is still really needed and we can apply that in other areas. The other piece that's critically important of what has happened is that a lot of the work that we've done locally has been about building trust. Um, and in addition to these partnerships, so that as vaccines came out, there was a group on the ground that people trusted, that people trusted to provide evidence-based information about you know, that the vaccines are safe and effective and that we needed to do that. So all these things come into play as we think about um, the next level. So in terms of how you get involved, get involved at the local level in terms of that and build on some of the great work that's been done um, during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say that in support of all the work that Amy and the task force and Layla are doing is the Marylanders for Food and Farm Worker Coalition, which is 15 organizations that came together. And um, we're there to support their efforts and to work collaboratively. And so in that question of how people can help it, you can actually donate to Kata, you can donate to the Migrant Clinicians Network and uh, the Maryland Pesticide Edu Education Network facilitates um, the Marylanders for Food and Farm Worker Coalition and certainly donations are welcome for that, argument, for that coalition. Okay, Ruth, uh, thank you. And um, that's, that's encouraging. It, it sounds like things are, are headed in a little better 
direction. And Amy, I'm just curious that local organization, is, is there a network of such organizations uh, around the US? Is there a place where people who are trying to help and be protective of farm and food workers come together to share common challenges? That's a great question. And I would say, no, there's not like one sort of commonplace, but there's a lot of really great efforts that are taking place right now um, in terms of uh, supporting groups that have community health workers um, who are working on the front lines, getting them trained with different information. So for instance, MCN has a project right now where we're working with 20 organizations across the country um, and uh, leaders from this organization come together every Tuesday. We give them an update on COVID-19, what's the latest information. Uh, we help them with resources. We help them uh, understand strategies about misinformation and disinformation. And um, they are then able to sort of take that to trickle down to the, to the front lines. Um, that's just an example of, of one program, but I, I do feel like it is, it's fairly, again, local or state and, and, and not um, necessarily easy to get involved sort of like one, one sort of one space um, across the country. Okay, all right. Great, um, so I'd like to bring it back to pesticides and personal protective equipment. So you showed a picture of a farm worker who had a substantial um, amount of, of pesticide carried in a backpack with a pump. It looked like it had a pump on it. And I, I noticed that there was a very light, yeah, so, so three routes of exposure is inhaling, dermal exposure or through the skin, and then ingesting, particularly in foods. So from this picture, we can see a fairly low level of protection for respiratory and dermal. Is, is it true that there are no legal requirements for farm workers to have personal protective equipment to keep them safe when they're using pesticides this way? So in the pesticide world, the, the, the label is the law, right? Um, and so depending on the type of pesticides um, it, or, or the, the type of pesticide, the requirements about what kind of personal protective equipment are, are per, per pesticide. Uh, there are a lot of regulations uh, around that um, and important ones. Um, and if uh, a worker is applying a pesticide, they're supposed to be trained um, about pesticides in general. Unfortunately, they don't have to get trained specifically on that pesticide. They need to be trained in how to safely apply pesticides. Um, for those, they call, they're called handlers. For those who are applying pesticides, um, there are um, generally, those are the workers that need to make sure that they're abiding by the um, personal protective equipment that's laid out on the label. Now, if you go back to my other slide about the different vulnerabilities um, of this population in terms of language, um, in terms of literacy level, it becomes quite challenging that we're so dependent on the label as the law in, in pesticide applications. And so what we've been doing um, a lot of work around um, throughout the years, and I, I think that a lot of the work for, you know, at the, the state pesticide work that's been done is looking at ways to um, make sure that the bad actors are, are not um, being used to make sure that we have the strongest worker protections in, in place. And so that comes up to another question that's on there. So I spent the good part, first part of my career from like 2001 until 2015 to strengthen the worker protection standard, which is the regulation that EPA oversees that looks at how do we minimize um, pesticide exposure among farm workers, those who are picking and harvesting, and then those who are applying um, pesticides. Up. So we that was strengthened in 2015. Uh, and it was a very important step forward, but a moderate step forward. And for those of us in, you know, worker health and safety, 
why OSHA is not the perfect entity. We all know that there's lots of challenges with OSHA. OSHA is set up to protect workers. Um, and OSHA, and then the, the one sort of uh, difference that, I, well, there's a lot of differences, but the difference that I just pointed out in terms of, you know, applicators are not necessarily trained in the specific chemical that they're applying. They're trained in pesticides in general. In OSHA, if you're working around a certain chemical, you're supposed to be trained in that chemical and how to protect yourself and how to use that chemical safely. It's a little bit more general when it comes to pesticides. But we did make really important steps forward, such as the respiratory protection piece. And there is a lot of requirements in the worker protection standard about following the label and what uh, PPE needs to be provided and what happens um, in, should a worker be exposed or should a worker be overexposed and what the requirements are for um, getting that worker the care they need. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of regulation around it. Enforcement is an issue um, and the strength of the regulation at times is an issue. In your time out on the farms, what do you think the uh, compliance is on, on those regulations? Does it tend to get close attention or does it tend to get lost in the shuffle of needing to get out there and get the job done? It's mixed and I'm going to let Layla respond to this one since she's out in the field a little bit more than I am. Yeah, it's difficult sometimes as um, um, Amy explained as, as mixed where some workers get um, trained uh, as far as entry in, um, in the certain areas where they have been applying pesticide. Sometimes it's, it, it is uh, a sign, sometimes it's not. The workers do get this train about pesticide, but it's not really about any in a specific. Um, they get about, you know, how avoid the contact or the, uh, especially in the fields that they work. Um, there is the handler, as, as Amy mentioned, that gets some training, but I think it gets lost toward the time because they're in rush, the farmers are rushed to collect their produce to bring it to market. And also the housing sometimes where they reside or the family are residing with children, are, it is very close to fields. Sometimes is uh, plain uh, pesticide also, and it comes over some of the communities as well as the housing for the migrant workers. Uh, <clears throat> We also in, in, in Cata do pesticide trainings to workers uh, in different migrant camps. And we have somebody who is an expert in pesticide training uh, with the workers. Um, <clears throat> the, the workers would not say anything if they are bring brought up you know to work in certain fields they are being uh sprayed or have a sprayed and they have no signs especially with the watermelons and the melons they have to be some pesticide and they they walk and they walk through the different you know areas that they have to pick the watermelons um <clears throat> those are the main things here in, in the area is the watermelons and melons uh, uh farms um, <clears throat> we don't have any really organic uh, farms nearby that, you know, they have the, the information for the, for the community or the uh, farm workers. Um, so I didn't, you know, as far as uh, pesticide with workers, they're definitely mixed as Amy um, mentioned, but the workers would not complain or would not say anything about pesticide exposure or entering before the time limit to to go into the fields. I don't know if that um, would, uh, on, you know, if that would answer your questions. I, I think it did for sure. Um, uh, Got to believe that in the hustle and bustle on the field, maybe this isn't a full compliance uh, kind of picture. And 
Um, so thank you, thank you so much, both of you. You've given us a lot to think about here. Uh, this is a really important issue. One person asked, um, I think, how this committee uh, got interested in the issue, and uh, we're interested for the obvious reason of worker safety and risk to our farm and food workers. We're also interested because, uh, as Amy pointed out, uh, the label is what defines use and application rates and how to keep people safe. And we would, we would be interested in knowing that there is training and some controls and enforcement in place to be sure that as these workers are applying pesticides, as we saw in that picture, that they're doing it per the, the label. So proper application is good for the environment in Chesapeake Bay as well. Uh, so, uh, well, thank you again, both of you for uh, all of this information today. So we've been together for three sessions and uh, we just heard a lot of information about a day in the life of farm and food workers with regard to pesticides and other risks. We just thought we'd take a couple of minutes to have you share any feelings you're having as uh, a result of all the information that we've provided. And uh, these questions ask, first of all, how do pesticides create social environmental justice issues? And then as a community, uh, as, as a community of stakeholders that come together around this topic, how can we be more protective, particularly of vulnerable populations. All right, thanks to everyone who have put some thoughts in chat. We're gonna leave that open for a while. So if you're still sharing there, uh, please feel free to com complete what you're offering. Uh, and now we're gonna thank our conference sponsors. Thank you to our fabulous sponsors. And we're gonna now check in on our working groups. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bonnie. Hi, everybody. Um, as project director, I'm really pleased to report on our project working groups. It's another way that the pesticides in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project is unique. And it's that many in our stakeholder community stay connected through the year in our four working groups. The working groups reflect the key areas where pesticide data and outreach coalesce, scientific research, agriculture, healthy alternatives and policy. And we have just a tremendous pool of experts assembled here today. We uh, find that many of you already lend your expertise to a working group and you help us identify needs and data gaps and opportunities through your insights and collaborative support. If you already serve on one of these working groups, we really wanna thank you. And if you're currently not involved, please consider getting involved. You'll see the, the, what each group uh, is involved with and its facilitators below. And I'm gonna take a few minutes to report out on what each group accomplished this year and what our focus will be as we move into 2022. Next. So the items in black type are things that we accomplished in 2021. And those items in blue type are things we'll be continuing to work on in the coming year. The research work group consists of scientists representing academic, state, and federal agencies. And we've been developing a white paper report that compiles studies since 2010 on pesticides that impact the Bay watershed as an update to our earlier 2009 white paper. We also updated a matrix-based 
unified methodology applied to eight compounds of concern. And the methodology assesses compounds on the basis of occurrence, persistence, chemical, physical properties, temporal seasonal patterns of application, toxicity, exposure pathways, solubility, and other relevant criteria. In light of glyphosate resistance pressures, we also began looking into changing herbicide formulations and use trends. One of the outputs resulted in Nathan Donnelly's presentation we saw on November 10th. And if you missed it, it's recorded and we'll post that in the conference webpage. Going into 2022, we'll be finalizing the white paper and generating a presentation to share with the Governor's Bay Cabinet, interested groups and our other working groups. If you're a scientist, please check the box on the survey and we'll send you an invitation to join the next working group meeting so you can get a better sense of the group. Next. This is a GIS map of Somerset County and it's an output of our agriculture working group. We've been educating farmers and the public about healthy soil practices that sequester carbon. A large percentage of land that's farmed in Maryland is rented farmland, somewhere between 67 and 80%. As the state works towards rewarding farmers to invest in soil health, which is a long-term process to increase soil carbon sequestration capacity, and it takes many years, we wanted to understand how rented farmland mostly on one to two year leases would disincentivize farmers from making these investments. When the maps enlarged, you can see by colored dots, which farmland parcels are owner occupied. There are 276 and which are not, there are 2,005. The available Maryland data gives physical addresses for the owners, but there's no contact information for messaging via phone or email. So one of the challenges facing this program will be educating landowners about the benefits of healthy soils and why longer term leases should be considered. For example, the work group is talking to other organizations who share this concern. Next. This working group has also been educating on the way pesticides destroy healthy soil biota, the small microbial communities that carry nutrients to plants and sequester carbon long term. In the coming year, we'll continue to work on healthy soils education and we'll also be updating our farmer information kit. This kit educates farmers and their families about pesticide hazards and safer alternatives. Working group members will also continue to share links and resources for the Go Organic Now website. If you're interested in these topics, please note that in the survey. Next. The Healthy Alternatives Working Group is focused on registered pesticide disinfectants and educating the public and our schools about risk to respiratory systems, as well as the many safer alternatives. Last week, a working group member, Margie Roswell, demoed our new dedicated saferdisinfectants.org website, which simplifies making these choices. You can really help us get the word out by linking to saferdisinfectants.org and sharing the site on social media. On this issue, the work group also contacted every Maryland County public school system and independent schools, alerting them to the issue of riskier and safer disinfectants and provided a, work, a fact sheet and a buying guide to safer products. We also continued our education campaigns for managing mosquitoes without pesticides, all the more important with the discovery of PFAS contamination and some of these mosquito control pesticides. And we educated with virtual presentations and social media on pesticide-free pesticide lawn care and gardens and pollinator protection. The work group will continue working on these projects and in our Jamboard process, I noticed that many of you noted the importance of educating the public and other specific sectors. So this is a critical area that takes so many ambassadors to really affect change in public behavior. So the work group here is a great place where you can join with like-minded people and advance these efforts with us. Let us know you're interested when you take the survey. Next. Formerly known as the Policy Working Group, the Smart on Pesticides Coalition has worked to educate legislators and the public around pesticide protections. We helped pass the Pollinator Protection Act in 2016, banning consumer use of neonics in the state. 
In 2017, we made sure that pollinator habitat on state lands prohibited bee harming pesticides from being used. And in 2019, we were instrumental in passing a ban on all uses of chlorpyrifos. This year, we worked to pass a bill to fix a loophole in the Pollinator Protection Act, which was needed because a group of retailers were continuing to sell neonic containing consumer lawn and garden products, which had been banned for consumers in 2018. Well, the pandemic shortchanged things for all of us, and the coalition became concerned that PPE shortages in the pandemic would further endanger field workers, many of whom apply pesticides, as you've heard. This led to a formation of a subcommittee of interested Smart on Pesticide members to work on this, and it grew to involve other organizations, now the 16 food and farm worker organizations and environmental groups who collaborate as part of the Marylanders for Food and Farm Worker Protection. This year, we worked for passage of a bill that would require mandatory protections for essential workers during the pandemic, including food production workers in the poultry and seafood industries, as well as farm field workers. So we want to again thank so many of you who are here today for sharing your expertise as members of these working groups. This provides like a 360 degree collaborative effort across these disciplines and professional capacities, organizations, agencies, and institutions. And so your con contributions are truly valued. If um, you all want to make any uh, further uh, efforts on our behalf. We would love to have you be part of our working groups. We are looking for new ways of advancing awareness of pesticide impacts, safer disinfectants, alternatives, and management strategies to meet the demands of very serious challenges. So don't forget when you take our survey, check a box and see what our work groups are like and get to know some of our amazing colleagues. Next. Our wonderful funders make our work possible, and we especially want to thank them for their support of the pesticides and the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project. Next. And we want to thank you for making time to attend today and for being part of our stakeholder community. We want to thank today's speakers, Hannibal Kemmerer, Layla Borea Kraus, and Amy Liebman. And we couldn't do it without our fabulous behind the scenes team of Ruth Berlin, our executive director, Greg Allen, our moderator and work group leader, Emily Ranson manning the webinar controls and our technical producer, Doug Miller. By the way, Doug also composed most of the wonderful music we played during the conference. We're gonna leave the webinar open for a bit. And if you wanna continue chatting with friends and we put the conference survey link in the chat. So please take a couple minutes to tell us how this was for you and what you'd like to see the conference include next time. Greg, any last words? Yes, thank you, Bonnie. And thanks to everyone for joining us over this series of three conference sessions. This was our 15th anniversary of our annual pesticides conference. We've been able to sustain it because people like you all participate and get involved really, again, encourage you to get involved with our work groups. Uh, but otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next year for our 16th annual Pesticides Conference. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great day. <laughs>